Great. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for uh, coming out to hear about this. Uh, it's a tough act to follow, but uh, I want to uh, talk today um, sort of about uh, partisan media in particular, but kind of more generally about media and the way in which they may or may not contribute um, to polarization. Um, right, so there, there's a lot of concern, right, as Professor Hershey mentioned, that the media environment is sort of fragmented, right? So um, I, and for those of you who are still in college, um, back in a time when you actually had to get up and change the channel, like it didn't mean clicking around, it literally <laughs> meant walking across the room and like changing it and then probably also adjusting the rabbit ears on top of the TV. Um, you can, I'm sure there's a YouTube video somewhere you could watch that would explain <laughs> that strange process to you. Um, right? You had three choices, right? There was ABC, there was NBC, and then there was CBS. And eventually when I was a kid, there became Fox, right? And so there were these three networks and they all basically told you the same thing, right? So they all gave you some sort of very, you know, kind of standard, right, two-handed approach to the media. On the one hand, on the other hand, right? But that's not what we have today, right? We have this media that presents a, a kind of proliferation of different views, right? Um, and so I, I'd sort of like to begin, um, you know, uh, with an example of this, right? So um, here is, you might remember that um, a few years ago, President Obama made a lot of headlines um, for coming out and saying that he supported gay marriage, right? So uh, here's one example. Uh, of a headline, right, when he did this, this is from CNN, uh, if you can't read it, it just says, Obama announces he supports same-sex marriage, right, and then you can click and there's a little embedded video to play of President Obama saying that he thinks same-sex marriage is a good idea, right? So this is, you know, pretty consistent with that kind of neutral, kind of fact-based um, journalism, right? But here's an example of a slightly different way of covering the same story. Right, so if you can't read this one, this is from Fox Nation, which is the editorial part of Fox News. It says, Obama flip-flops, comma, declares war on marriage, right? <laughs> um, so same story, very different coverage, right? A and so this kind of coverage, right, is maybe um, a little bit uh, more kind of normatively troubling, potentially, right? Because we might think that seeing this kind of coverage is going to have more of an effect on people's um, attitudes, right? So. Uh, I'd like to, to spend uh, some time today, and I'll, I'll try to keep it reasonably brief, talking about why we think that this kind of coverage might matter, right? But at the same time, I want to suggest to you, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, um, right, that this kind of coverage and the decline of it um, matters a great deal as well. Um, so. Uh, let's start by thinking about, um, so just sorry, by way of definition, when I talk about um, kind of media fragmentation or partisan media, what I mean are sort of sources that don't necessarily obey this kind of, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, style of journalism, right? So this is, uh, if you, you know, watch cable news, Fox News and MSNBC are the two biggest proponents of it. Uh, you know, more readily you could find this on talk radio. Think of someone like Hugh Hewitt or uh, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, those kind of folks. Uh, if you read blogs, Instapundent, Daily Kos, um, those sorts of things. Right? So um, let's start by thinking the most kind of obvious question we tend to get about this, right? Does this kind of content, right, this more kind of partisan content, does it lead people to have um, more polarized attitudes, right? Does it drive people away from the political center and towards the political extremes, right? Um, and so the basic rationale for this is that this is some sort of echo chamber um, type of argument, right? And so the idea is that uh, I'm a conservative, I sit down and I listen to, say, Sean Hannity or Bill O'Reilly, um, right, Megyn Kelly, and, you know, I hear them repeat back conservative arguments to me, and so I think, like, yes, those are really strong, compelling arguments, right? And to the extent that they present the other side, they do it in this kind of, you know, it's a sort of a caricature of the argument, right? They don't really give it its full force, they immediately discredit it, right? And we know the way people kind of process information, right? We like information that agrees with what we already believe, right? So um, that, you know, makes us more likely to accept uh, these sorts of arguments, right? And so we also know that when we hear arguments that reinforce uh, what we already believed, right, that tends to make us, you know, think like, oh, my position must really be right, right? You know, so I believe that argument, right, a little bit more strongly, and maybe now instead of just sort of supporting tax cuts, now I support them more strongly, right? Um, 
But, you know, the, the trouble with any kind of media study is that there's this classic problem that social scientists think about that's called selection. Is this a selection effect or is this a treatment effect, right? And so a selection effect, right, basically means that the kinds of people who come to partisan media are different to begin with, right? The kind of person who sits down and watches Rachel Maddow or Bill O'Reilly or Megyn Kelly is different than the kind of person who sits down and watches the CBS Evening News, right, or doesn't want to watch any news at all, right? Uh, so that's a selection story. A treatment story is the act of sitting down and watching this changes my belief, right? And, and the evidence is gonna suggest that both of these things are actually sort of going on, right? And why do we think that there might be um, some selection effects? So I want to walk you through just some very quick uh, numbers, right? And so this is how many people watch different TV shows. So I just pulled this up. This is from two weeks ago. Um, so uh, as we've all know, as we've all, I'm sure, heard, right, the media market has got fragmented quite dramatically in recent years. So um, two weeks ago, the most watched program uh, was uh, Sunday Night Football. Um, I don't know who was playing. Um, sorry, I don't follow sports. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, so about 23 and a half million, uh, 23.5 or 05 million people watched uh, Sunday Night Football a few weeks ago. I don't know, maybe it was a good game. Um, so sports almost always is the largest. If there's any major sporting event, that's almost always the largest um, single sort of show. Um, the largest broadcast show was NCIS. Um, uh, what's interesting about NCIS is that this show dominates um, predominantly with people who are over 50, right? The only people I know, just looks like, for what it's worth, the only people I know who've ever turned on an episode of NCIS are all people my parents' age or older. Draw from that what you will. Um, but there's 18 million of them watching it, um, right? The, the number one uh, show in the key QM, which is the, the key um, audience demographic, is um, Modern Family. Uh, so the one audience, advertisers pay the most for are people who are between the ages of 18 and 34. So Modern Family is the winner there, although it's not the overall winner here. Um, right, so then after that, Dancing with the Stars got about 12 million people. Um, I didn't even know that was still on. That was a surprise to me. Um, and then we come to the much maligned NBC Nightly News, which uh, is the most popular of the three major news networks. Uh, it gets about 9 million people on average a night. Uh, that's down quite a bit. Uh, from where it was uh, 30 years ago. We'll get back to that point in a minute. Um, but just to give you a sense, right, we'd have to skip way down the list now, and I'm going to show you where Fox and MSNBC are, right? So Fox News on prime, in prime time averages about 1.8 million viewers, right? Um, the most watched show on Fox, which is Bill O'Reilly, gets just a hair over 2 million uh, viewers a night. It was up a little bit more last year, but not hugely so. Um, and MSNBC, um, woe to them, uh, they only get about 775,000 viewers on average across prime time. Their leading show, uh, Rachel Maddow, gets just over 900,000, which is a pretty big improvement from earlier in the year where she was barely even pulling in 775, right? So that notice, right, up here with these more popular shows, right, their audience is massively dwarfing, right, the audience for these more partisan programs. Right? Um, so there just really aren't a whole lot of people, right, keeping in mind um, that there's 245 million or so American adults over the age of 18, right? It's a fraction of 1% who are, you know, sort of regularly tuning in to one of these shows, right? Um, and so I think there's two points to conclude from that, right? One, right, the people who turn out and watch these shows are weird, kind of ex-ante, and I'll show you some more evidence that they're weirder even than this would suggest in a minute. Um, but uh, no offense if any of you, I mean, I've watched them sometimes too, but um, <laughs> weird here need not be taken in a pejorative sense, it just means non-ordinary, um, right? The uh, other sort of important thing that's happened is that a lot of people don't watch the NBC um, nightly news anymore, the ABC or the, the CBS nightly news, right? So um, a long time ago when I was a kid, like if you wanted to watch TV between six and seven, that was choice, right? You watched, there was um, nightly news, and then there was local news, and that was it. And if you were going to watch TV, that's what you watched. And so there's a political scientist at Princeton, Marcus Pryor, who's done some really nice work showing that, you know, uh, a generation or two ago, when people 
um, watch those shows, right, they were more likely to, um, you know, then go out and vote and, and participate because they maybe knew a little bit more politically. But now that there's so many different options, right, um, you know, so I brought up this anecdote to my students a few years ago and they didn't even believe me that there was a nightly news show that was on at six, right? Because like, why would you watch that when you could watch an episode of like Friends or, you know, stream something on Hulu or watch some like funny cat videos on YouTube, right? Um, or you could watch Twitch, which I just found out about, which I I'm kind of fascinated that you can just watch people playing video games, um, right? So, you know, the fact that those people have kind of dropped out, they're not watching the nightly news now, right? They're watching sports or they're, you know, watching something from their DVR, if they're watching TV at six o'clock, right now they know less and they participate less. And the reason that matters is those are the kind of, you know, moderate swing voters that we hear about, right? The kinds of people who are watching Fox and MSNBC, right, they haven't dropped out of the electorate because they really like politics, right? They consume it as a hobby, right? It's these people who are kind of, you know, not very politically interested, but if they'll sit down and watch the news, right, if that's their only option, right? So they know less, right, they're less informed about politics, so they've dropped out. Right, so I think that's one of the things, the, that's sort of an indirect way in which shifts in the media have contributed to making elections more partisan. But another way is, um, that I'll show you is that these people who watch Fox and NBC are even less normal than this would suggest, right? Um, and so this is, I'm going to show you some data from the 2008 Annenberg National Election Study where they asked a very detailed battery of these questions. It's actually hard to find data on what people who watch these shows think because it, you, it's rare to get enough of them in a sample that you can actually analyze. Um, right, so just for the sake of argument, there's more Fox viewers and it just as Fox is more popular. Um, it's not meant to pick on them. Right, so I just looked at people, this is, we're going to show you some attitudes of people who don't watch Fox and attitudes of people who do watch Fox. Right? So uh, if you just look at the sample of people who don't watch Fox, about 37% of them uh, are, are uh, Republican. Right? Of Fox viewers, 6 in 10 of them are Republican. Right? And if we look at strong Republicans, right, so people who really strongly identify with the Republican Party, right, about 12% of the non-Fox sample are strong Republicans, but uh, more than a quarter are strong Republicans in the Fox sample. Right? Um, likewise for conservatives, right, and so this is slightly an, an overestimate, right, because people attach a positive valence to the word conservative, we know that, right, but about a third of non-Fox viewers say they're conservative, but half of people who watch Fox say they're conservative, right, and if we look at, um, there's a measure of affect, political scientists like to use called a feeling thermometer, where we ask you to rate someone on a scale between zero and 100, zero means you don't like the person at all, 100 means you think they're amazing, Right, 50 means you're kind of indifferent to them. Most people, yeah, kind of indifferent towards President Obama, right, 50 degrees. Um, no, among Fox viewers, right, it's at 42 degrees, which is just about a full standard deviation lower, right? So quite a bit lower among those who watch Fox, right? Right, so not only are they kind of a small fraction, right, they're different, right? And we could have made a similar, you know, sort of slide um, that would be equivalent for people who watch MSNBC, right? Um, so you might, so that's to suggest to you that there's quite a bit of selection, right, that's going on kind of beforehand, right? These people are coming to the programs differently. But that doesn't answer the question of whether or not the programs themselves change their attitudes. And the answer is, um, like many academic answers, a yes but. Um, so does it change people's attitudes? Yes, it does. Um, if you, I, I can talk more about why we think that's the case. Um, it's, I've done a bunch of experiments on that. Um, and so the reason I think the but is important though, right, is that it's, the effects are concentrated, right, um, on people who already come to it who are sort of extreme, right? So the effects come primarily for people who already kind of watch these shows and know something about them. Right, and so like part of the reason for that being is that you kind of need to know what to make of the arguments, right? So if I tell you, you know, Obama is a Kenyan, you know, socialist Muslim, right? You need to know like what those phrases mean and how you kind of fit that into your evaluation of it, right? So most of the effect for these people, it's not like people who, who sort of don't, you know, if you sit down someone in a lab and you show them the show, right, if they don't watch it, they're like, what is this? This is bizarre, right? But if you watch it, you're like, yes, this is good. I like this. I can, you know, use this to kind of update my beliefs, right? So that, uh, you know, the evidence suggests that most of the effect is already occurring on people who are already somewhat extreme, right? So it's not that these shows kind of shift the middle of the distribution. They kind of lengthen out the tails um, of the extremes. 
And I, picking up on something Professor Hershey said, I think one of the, the more important effects, if you've ever watched these shows, right, is it's not so much they build up your own side, it's that they tear down the other side really effectively. And so they have really strong effects on the way people think about the opposition, right? And they like the other side much less um, after watching them, right? Uh, and so, sorry, I'm, as usual, I've gone on too long. Um, but so you might say, well, you know, does this matter, right? It's no big deal. Like one and a half percent of the population watches these things, right? Does it really matter, even if it makes them really extreme? Um, I want to suggest to you that it probably does, right? For a couple of reasons. One, um, these people are, are pretty influential, right? Because the kinds of people who do this are more likely to be, um, you know, kind of decision leaders in their social networks, um, right? They're kind of influentials, to pull up an old term, right? And I've done some other work we can talk about in the Q and A. Um, that part of the way that these effects spread is they spread through social networks. So, you know, if any of you maybe had this experience at Thanksgiving, right, you have uh, un an uncle or an aunt or a cousin who loves Fox News and they say, did you see that story about, you know, Benghazi and why the Democrats are still trying to bury it, right? So even if you don't watch, right, they're spreading some of that impact potentially to you. Um, so I think there are probably some agenda setting effects, right, but in a slightly different way than Professor Hershey talked about, right, that these shows keep certain stories alive that otherwise would die. Um, right, so a good example of this would be um, the Acorn scandal in 2010 um, or the Planned Parenthood, you know, sort of uh, story about fetal tissue resales this summer, right? I don't see, now it's hard because we don't observe what the right counterfactual is, but I don't see how those stories would have survived absent partisan media to kind of keep, you know, kind of priming and churning that story, um, right? Um, and so uh, I'll say, uh, are there any solutions? Um, probably not. I'm sorry to end on a, a negative note. Um, I mean, the, so I think the best solution um, is something this woman in Texas, Talia Stroud, is doing, trying to make news more engaging, but it turns out that's really hard. <laughs> sorry. 